And the title of our sermon this morning is Christ Our King. Christ Our King. And in our ongoing study in the essentials, we've had the joy and privilege of spending our time over the last several weeks uh, considering the person and work of our great Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, As the one mediator between God and men, he is the one anointed by God to be prophet, priest, and king to his people, the church. Three offices of the Christ that are necessary to our salvation. Uh, Our confession, the London Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, chapter 8, article 10, says this way, this number and order of offices is necessary For in respect of our ignorance, we stand in need of his prophetical office. In respect of our alienation from God and imperfection of the best of our services, we need his priestly office to reconcile us and present us acceptable unto God. And in respect to our averseness and utter inability to return to God and for our rescue and security from our spiritual adversaries, We need his kingly office to convince, subdue, draw, uphold, deliver, and preserve us to his heavenly kingdom. I love the way that's stated there in our confession, and I commend that to your review and meditation. That is a wise statement with respect to the offices of Christ. Now, this morning, we then have the joy and blessing of looking to the word of God with respect to the office of Christ our King. Uh, As our prophet, Christ is the word of God, the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his person. Uh, Seeing him on the pages of scripture, hearing him through scripture, we see and we hear the Father, unlike any other prophet that went before him. And as our priest, he enters the holy place once for all, obtaining eternal redemption for his people through the sacrifice of himself. Therefore, upon that glorious work, God also has highly exalted him, right? He's highly exalted him as king. God has highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is exalted as king, do you see? The biblical account really begins with God appointing man in that role. Man is made in the image of God, and man is appointed, Adam is appointed as king or as vice regent over creation. Listen to Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion, there it is again, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The one that God created in his image would rule and reign over his creation as king. As God's image bearer, Adam was tasked, would be responsible for mediating and extending the glory of God's sovereign and gracious rule over all the face of the earth. That was Adam's role. And being, by being fruitful, by multiplying and multiplying image bearers, the earth would then be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. It was God's intention through Adam's reign as king over his creation. However, the first Adam fails. Adam fails, falling into sin. Rather than being a blessed ruler uh, that God had intended, Adam plunges the world into sin, misery, and woe. And now Adam is head over a posterity that would be rebels, enemies of God by wicked works, enemies of God's kingdom. 
So God would raise up then Abraham, the patriarch of the Jewish nation. Abraham's descendants would grow into a mighty nation. And God would deliver them out of bondage in Egypt, bring them into the wilderness, and they would become to him a kingdom of priests. And that word kingdom is important. It respects the the rulership or the reign of God himself over them. They were to be a kingdom of priests, a theocracy under the rule of God alone as their king. Now, like Adam, the nation of Israel were to mediate and extend the blessings of God's rule to the nations. From the promised land, the temple in Jerusalem, God himself, Isaiah chapter 37, 16 says, God himself enthroned between the cherubim, alone God and ruler over all the kingdoms of the earth, and now through them his glory filling the earth as the waters cover the sea. Well, the problem isn't with the king. <laughs> the problem isn't with his intended kingdom. His people, his subjects are the problem. His people are stiff-necked, and they are rebellious subjects. They would forget the Lord who delivered them out of Egypt. When there was no earthly king in Israel, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So they rejected the Lord as king over them, and they asked for, they begged for, a king for themselves like all the other nations around them. They rejected God. And so God gave them Saul, who himself became corrupt, and Saul rebelled against the Lord. He simply, in his conduct, wasn't worthy to be king, and so the kingdom was ripped from him. The anointing, the spirit, was taken from him, and God raised up then a man after his own heart to be king. A man after his own heart, God gave them David. Now, despite the fact that David was a man after God's own heart, uh, David was also a man of blood. His reign as Israel's king is marred and corrupted by his own sin. David wouldn't be the perfect king. He would not be Israel's promised king. He would not be the one through whom the promises of a kingdom would be fulfilled. But David would point forward to that person, right? David would point forward. It would not be through David's rule that the glory of the Lord would fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. However, with David, God would promise a great king from his own lineage that would sit upon the throne of David forever. And God would establish his throne, his rule, his kingdom forever. Turn with me to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Let's look at verse 1 together. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, David is drawing near now to the end of his life. He has been tremendously, abundantly blessed by God. God has given him rest from all his enemies. He's given David wealth, given David prosperity. And so David now, in ease, in comfort, having rest from all his enemies all around, David sitting in what is certainly a a beautiful palace, right? A palace that he built for for himself, a house made of cedar with all the accoutrements that would come with a glorious, a beautiful palace made for a king. And David sitting around looking at all this prosperity, all this abundance that God had blessed him with, begins to think to himself, how might he honor the Lord with gratitude for all the Lord has done for him? So it came to pass in verse 1, when the king was dwelling in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that King David said to Nathan the prophet, see now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Now, see with me what David here begins to think. Up to this point in time, the ark of God which symbolizes his presence, God's presence with his people. God was said to dwell between the cherubim that were made, fashioned on the top of the ark, sitting atop the mercy seat. God's presence with his people signified by the presence of the ark. This ark has been kept in a tabernacle, basically a big tent. Uh, had poles, curtains, fabric that you could easily pack up and move. It wasn't permanent. It was movable. 
And so David then has thoughts. I'm sitting in a house made with cedar, this beautiful house, a permanent location. I want to build a house for God. David has thoughts then of building the temple, a great structure for the Ark of the Covenant that would be immovable, would be permanent, that would said to, to be a dwelling place for God. Verse 3, so then Nathan said to the king, well, that sounds good to me, right? Go, David, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day. But I have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel, right, from such lows to such lofty heights. And I've been with you wherever you've gone, I've cut off all your enemies from before you, and have made you a great name, like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, verse 10, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them anymore as previously, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people, people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. Now look at the promises given in verses 10 through 11. The Lord promises to plant his people of Israel. He promises to protect his people Israel, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them anymore. And he promises to preserve a kingdom, right? A house that he was, will build for David. He's speaking not of a physical house, but a dynasty, right? What does the Lord mean by this? David's sitting in a beautiful house. What does he mean that he'll make him a house? The Lord speaks of David's lineage and what would happen to the kingdom after David dies. What would become of the kingdom? I'm sure this is on David's mind as he's drawing near the end of his life. What would become of God's people? And God now describes how he's going to fulfill these promises to plant, protect, and preserve his people. Uh, fulfill these promises now of hope and blessing. Look at verse 12. So when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, this is how I'm going to do it. Right? I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. In other words, a king from the house, from the lineage, from the dynasty of David. He's going to establish David's dynasty. Verse 13, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the, thr the throne of his kingdom forever. Again, God isn't merely here referring to a lineage or a dynasty. He's also referring to a kingdom a kingdom that this great king will rule over. He will build up, this king will build up a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Right? Solomon comes after David, and we know that Solomon builds the physical temple. This king will build a great house. This king will build up a dwelling place of God in the spirit. And the throne of his kingdom will last into the, the eternity, will last into the ages, will last forever. Verse 14, God says, I will be his father. He shall be a son to me. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. Now here in verse 14, God promises what we know as covenant love, his covenant loving kindness, his hesed, his steadfast love. He promises to this one that he will call his son. I will be his father and he shall be my son. Now notice there's also a covenantal sanction given. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. Now why would that be? Well, for the one whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Uh, we understand that as the people of God, as sons and daughters of the king. 
whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. That's Hebrews chapter 12, right? But there's covenant language being used here. I will be his father. He shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I'll chasten him with the rod of men. Verse 15, but my mercy shall not depart from me as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house, your kingdom, shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. When the Lord says forever, the Lord means forever, right? Everlastingly. According to all these words, verse 17, and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. That's a three-part promise of God there in verse 16. Three-part promise. Your dynasty through this king will be established forever. Your kingdom under the reign of this king will be established forever. And your throne, the place of all authority, the place of all majesty, the place of all rule, the place of all dominion, that throne will be established forever. Now, this text in 2 Samuel chapter 7 refers to what we understand to be the Davidic covenant. There's the language here of covenant. God promises David a future king. Well, David would meditate on these things. I'm sure they encouraged his heart. Uh, he was lifted up into the heavenly, so to speak, thinking about the glories of this coming king and this coming kingdom. And David, med meditating on these things and dwelt by the Spirit of God, would prophesy of this future coming king. And he'd prophesy through the Psalms, among other places. Look at Psalm 110. Look at Psalm 110. One of the Psalms most quoted in the New Testament, Psalm 110, a Psalm that we looked at last Lord's Day with respect to Christ our High Priest. Now, Psalm 110 with respect to Christ our King. Psalm 110 is a Psalm of David. And David here in Psalm 110 brings us now into a conversation between the Lord, who is God, Yahweh, and someone that David refers to as my Lord. This is a conversation between Yahweh and one who is Lord to David. Also, look at verse 1. The Lord, Yahweh, said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now, thinking of this very psalm of David, the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament asks the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 22, verse 41, the Lord asked the Pharisees, who do you think I am? What do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? The Pharisees said to him, the son of David. The Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, is the son of David. So he said to them, how then does David in the spirit, the one who cannot lie, <laughs> how does David in the spirit then call him Lord? The Lord said to my Lord, verse 1, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, the Lord asks, how is he David's son? You see the issue, right? The issue that the Lord is bringing up with his question. This one who is a son of David is far greater than David. He's David's Lord. David is the head of a dynasty. David is the head of a household, the head of a, of a kingly authority that will last into the ages. And yet this one, far greater than David, is one whom David calls Lord. And notice, this son, this son of David, whom David calls Lord, far superior to David, takes his seat at the very right hand of God. In other words, this Lord, this descendant of David, is highly exalted by God. God highly exalts him. He doesn't merely ascend into heaven, right? He's not merely seated in the heavenly places. The ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ is to the very right hand of God the Father. He sits enthroned at God's right hand. It sits enthroned at the, the place of greatest honor, greatest majesty, greatest authority in heaven itself, over all of heaven and over all of earth. In other words, this one who is David's Lord takes the throne that is promised to David's seed. 2 Samuel chapter 7, do you see? 
entering into covenant with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, God promised to establish the throne of his kingdom forever through a son, through his son, through a son of David. But David clearly understood this would be no ordinary son. Peter, preaching on this very text at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse 29, Peter said this, Therefore, David, being a prophet... And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. David, being a prophet, knew what the Lord would do here. That he would raise up the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the very son of God, to sit on his throne. And notice also, this Christ, the one who sits enthroned, is enthroned until his enemies are made his footstool. The word there for enemies is actually a verbal. It's a participle. And it describes those who act with enmity or hostility toward this glorious king. Until his enemies, that's a verb. Until those who act with hostility toward him until those who are enemies of God by wicked works, until those who are at enmity with him are made his footstool. Right? In other words, he, he rules now, even now, in heaven until, until a future time when all of those who are at enmity against him are put down, trampled underfoot, forced into submission, his boot on their neck until all his enemies are made his footstool. That describes so many in our world today, doesn't it? It once described us at enmity with God by wicked works until our gracious prophet, the one who by his spirit through his people preach the gospel to us until our gracious high priest show, showed us the gospel wherein our great high priest entered into the most holy place with an offering of himself died once for all to redeem us and now as our great king subdued our rebellious heart to himself we were those who were at enmity against him. We were those who were hostile toward him. We were enemies deserving to be made his footstool. There's so many, brothers and sisters, there's so many people today who are at enmity. They are enemies of this great king, our prophet, priest, and king. They might not even think about it or say it in those terms, right? You talk to most people, I'm not an enemy of Jesus Christ. Like, you know, I don't have it. But because they live in rebellion against him, right? And you apply the law of God and you see the hostility and the enmity just percolate up to the surface. Um, they are enemies of God. And this great king will rule until all of his enemies are made his footstool. How would you then think about that? Don't be his enemy. Turn from your sin. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's made provision for your sin, that you can be a son or a daughter in the kingdom under the gracious rule of our great king, not as enemies who will be made as footstool. There will come a day, there will come a day when the Lord Jesus Christ will consummate the fullness of the kingdom, and he'll do so by putting all of his enemies under his feet. God had promised to establish the reign of this king by sending him to deliver his people and to lead his people in triumph. Look at verse 2. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. The rod of your strength. That means great power. In Psalm 2, it's a rod of iron. A rod that can crush his enemies. He shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. In other words, crush the wicked. Establish your reign in power and rule even in the midst of your enemies. 
verse 3. Your people shall be volunteers. They will offer themselves willingly. Free will offering of all of our lives as subjects to this great king. Your people shall be volunteers in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, the king priest, right? Not being able to separate those two in Melchizedek or in Christ. He is prophet, priest, and king. Look at verse five. The Lord is at your right hand. God himself is at the right hand of this great king. And so his victory will be overwhelming. It'll be unquestionable, inarguable, overwhelming. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. In other words, verse 7, he'll be refreshed after his difficult work. He'll be refreshed, right? David is writing this psalm concerning the everlasting rule, the everlasting reign of the coming Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the one who is king of kings and lord of lords. Beautiful, right? Beautiful in the psalms, David thinking about these realities. The questions would certainly begin to rise in reading these Old Testament texts, uh, questions would begin to rise at the preaching of the prophets. Uh, the people knew that God's promises were generational. And so with each successive generation, as the generations pass into history, there would be this growing messianic expectation, this growing messianic anticipation. Who will this be? And when will all these things come to pass? And so many texts refer to this coming king. So many texts in the Old Testament, we can't possibly get through all of them in a time like this. Passages abound. Flip back in the Psalms. Let's just stay in the Psalms and flip back to Psalm 45. Psalm 45. Again, another messianic psalm about the king who is coming. The heading of this psalm, Psalm 45, describes the psalm as a love song between this king and his bride. This is beautiful. It's a love song between the king and his bride. Look at verse 1. The psalmist says, My heart is overflowing, overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Right? He's just biting it a bit. He's got to get this out. It, Verse 2 begins the description of the royal bridegroom, the royal kingly bridegroom. And in verse 2, we see the excellence of his person. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Right, the people who heard the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ were astonished at his teaching. Right, this, this man speaks like no other man we've ever heard before. Right, listen to the words that graciously flow from his lips. Uh, grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. He's exalted. Uh, the name above every name is given to him. Sinners treat him with contempt. Sinners treat him with scorn, right? He's uh, smitten, stricken, and afflicted. He's despised and rejected of men, Isaiah 53. Sinners treat him with scorn, but God has blessed him forever, given him the name which is above every name. So we see the excellence of his person. In verse 3, verses 3 through 5, we see the greatness of his power. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty. And in your majesty ride prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. Your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. Verses 6 through 9, we see the splendor of his kingdom. The excellence of his person, the greatness of his power, the splendor of his kingdom. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia. Out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad, kings' daughters are among your honorable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. And that's a reference to his royal bride. The second half of this psalm, his royal bride. 
verses 10 through 17. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also in your father's house, so the king will greatly desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Worship him. It's just a beautiful psalm, a beautiful picture of our coming king and his bride, which is the church. Listen to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth, they set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ, right? against his Messiah, against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces, cast away their cords from us. We will not have this one to rule over us. And he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. And he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the end of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Down in verse 12, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all of those who put their trust in him. Despite these messianic expectations, right? The messianic anticipation. Kings come and go on the pages of the Old Testament. Kings come and go. David's son Solomon builds a house for the Lord, builds this temple. Beautiful, glorious, tremendous building, this temple. God blesses Solomon immeasurably, unlike any other man on the planet, with wisdom and with wealth and with prosperity. And what does Solomon do? Solomon falls into sin, falls into sin. Under the conduct of horribly wicked kings, the northern tribes are led away captive to Assyria in 722 BC. Under the influence of horribly wicked kings, the southern kingdom is then led away captive, exile to Babylon in 586 BC. And certainly they must have thought, has God's promise to David been forsaken? Has his promise been forsaken? Has God abandoned his word? God promised to appoint a place for Israel, promised to plant them, that they may dwell in a place that is their own and not move around anymore. He promised to protect them from their enemies all around them, to preserve the kingdom through the line of David forever. And yet here the people of Israel, either to the north or to the south, they're off in exile they're scattered abroad in exile. God promised that the sons of, the, of wickedness would not oppress them anymore. And here they are under the oppression of sons of wickedness. They're in bondage, hard bondage, to a wicked and oppressive people. God promised a glorious king to rule over his people in righteousness. That he would establish his kingdom, his throne forever. And yet the king is deposed. The king is eventually killed there's no longer a kingdom to rule. The people are in exile. History then drifts into 400 years of silence from God. Did God abandon his word? Has God's covenant with David been forsaken? Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Did God forsake his covenant with David? Has God abandoned faithfulness, covenant faithfulness to his word? Mark chapter 1, and look there at verse 1. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before your face. In fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures, this, message, this messenger who will prepare your way before you, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem 
went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. And suddenly, right, suddenly, after 400 years of silence, this Elijah-like figure, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, this Elijah-like figure comes preaching a baptism of repentance, seemingly coming out of nowhere. And why? Why does he come? Because the king is coming. Right? He preaches because the king is coming. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. Verse 7. And he preached saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, at his baptism in the Jordan, verse 10, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. He was anointed by the Spirit. That oil anointing prophets, priests, and kings in the Old Testament now pointing forward to the anointing that Jesus Christ would receive by the Spirit at his baptism. The Spirit descends upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, from heaven. <laughs> you are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In other words, God speaks. <laughs> God speaks, not a prophet, not now mediated through a prophet. God speaks, not now mediating the anointing of a prophet, priest, or king through a prophet. God anoints the Son with the Spirit. This is the long-awaited and promised Son of David. God had promised David, I will be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. And he says in verse 11, you are my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Rather than speaking through the prophet, rather than anointing through the prophet, God speaks himself. God anoints the Son himself, the Christ with the Holy Spirit. This one is the Son of God. He is the Christ, the anointed one. His baptism in verse 11 followed by immediately co immediate conflict in verse 12. Immediately, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. This one would be tested just as Adam was tested by the serpent. Tested in a wilderness that was caused by Adam's sin, wild beasts, a consequence of the fall surrounding him, and the wicked one. With the world under his sway, in the temptation of the Lord Jesus Christ, would offer him all the kingdoms of the earth, all the kingdoms he would offer to the Christ. Something that the Lord Jesus Christ already possessed. He would offer the kingdoms to the Christ if the Christ would simply bow down and worship him. Where Adam would fail, he, the second Adam, the last Adam, the great Adam, would triumph. As Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years, he was 40 days in the wilderness. Where Israel would fail, time and time again, he would triumph. Verse 14 now, after John was put in prison, Jesus then came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Why is the kingdom of God at hand? Why is the kingdom of God at hand? It's because the king has come. <laughs> the king has come. Throughout his earthly ministry, the multitudes would refer to Jesus Christ in this way, calling him the son of David. That's important that the people in Judea, in Galilee, referred to him as the son of David. They were viewing him as the promised son, <laughs> as a fulfillment of the Davidic covenant, the promised king. The genealogies in Matthew and Luke, they trace his lineage through David. Le legally, through Joseph, in Matthew chapter 1, biologically through Mary in Luke chapter 3. And that's why these ge genealogies are so important. You can also almost imagine, right, Matthew before writing his gospel, Luke before writing his gospel, going to look at the records 
and checking through every name through the history back to David, back to Abraham, and in the case of Luke, back to Adam, the son of God, right? Amazing, checking all those. 14 generations from, I think it was from Adam to Abraham, 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the Christ, right? Um, amazing, those genealogies. When Jesus met Nathaniel, after seeing him under the fig tree in John chapter 1. At the very beginning of the Lord's ministry, he's just gathering to himself the 12 disciples. Nathaniel said, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Nathaniel calls him the king of Israel. Blind men following him, crying out from the side of the road, son of David, have mercy on us, calling him the son of David. Matthew chapter 12, verse 23, the multitudes were amazed at him and asked themselves, amongst themselves, could this one be the son of David? Messianic expectation, kingly anticipation, right? When the Pharisees heard them doing this, they accused them of casting out demons by Beelzebub. But Jesus said to them, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God has come upon you. There's always a link. There's a link, we can't forget, between the kingdom and the king. We see the kingdom of God coming. Why is the kingdom of God coming? Because the king has come. The king has come. As the Lord enters Jerusalem before his crucifixion, Matthew records the crowds following the Lord, crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. He's riding on a donkey entering the city like an arriving king. Luke hears others shouting, rejoicing, praising God with a loud voice, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heavy, heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees called out to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Like, what are you doing, Lord, allowing them to heap such praise upon you? He answered them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. He's the king, the promised king. He's the Messiah, the Christ. It would be that very week that Christ our king, the son of God, would inaugurate his kingdom. He's always been sovereign. He's always been sovereign. But it's through his incarnation that he assumes the role of the last Adam, the promised seed of Abraham, the true Israel, the son of David, the promised king and God's anointed mediator. And as prophet, priest, and king, he saves his people from their sin and ushers in his everlasting dominion. God had promised Adam and Eve a violent and bloody conflict between the seed of the woman and the serpent. The promised king would be crucified. The serpent would be destroyed. And as the Lord Jesus Christ, in his mock trial, as he stood before Pilate on the day of his death, Pilate asked the Lord, questioning him in John 18, are you a king then? And Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. That's out of the, word, the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say rightly, I'm a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth, and everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. You're right, I'm a king, he said. He told the Pharisees, Hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. It's tragic to think about the Lord um, that day at that trial uh, and those wicked men heaping scorn and derision upon him, mocking him. And interesting that the blasphemy that pours out of the hearts and minds of these wicked men who stood against him is blasphemy directed particularly at his perfected work as our prophet, priest, and king. It's very interesting. Jesus Christ is the promised prophet. In Matthew 26, verse 68, the Pharisees spit in his face, they strike him with the palms of their hands, and they mock him saying, prophesy to us, Christ. 
He's the prophet. Prophesy to his Christ. Who's the one who struck you? And they blaspheme the Lord as prophet. Jesus saves us. He delivers us from our sin as our great high priest. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 41, they blaspheme the Lord in that office as our savior priest. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Right? Come down from the cross. <laughs> in the very next verse, in Matthew 27, they mock the Lord as king. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. And even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. They mocked him as our prophet, priest, and king. And then these wicked men crucify the Lord of glory. But it's at the cross that Christ our King triumphs over all his enemies and over all our enemies. He triumphs over sin and death. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15, he disarms principalities and powers. He makes a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in, in it, in the cross. Through the death of of the king, he inaugurates, establishes his kingdom, and he ascends to the throne through the cross. Through his resurrection, raised in power, he's exalted as king. And through his ascension into glory, it's through his ascension that he receives the kingdom from the Father. Turn back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel speaks to this. When the Lord Jesus Christ ascended, he ascended to the Father, and he receives the kingdom. Daniel chapter 7. Look there, beginning at verse 9. Daniel, receiving a vision here, says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. And I watched then, because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. It's in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. That's already happened, by the way. That took place. That took place in heaven when the Lord Jesus Christ ascended to the Father, that glorious scene. Beautiful, right? To imagine, to think about the Lord Jesus Christ in power, resurrected, now receiving dominion and a kingdom, one which shall not be destroyed. He sits now at the right hand of the majesty, ruling and reigning from heaven as our king. As our king, ruling and reigning, he gives us, his subjects, the commission of his kingdom. The commission of his kingdom. Matthew chapter 28, listen, verse 18. Jesus says before he ascends to the Father, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. Why? Because Jesus Christ is king. Jesus Christ as king has been given all authority, all authority over heaven and on earth. The Lord says in that context, he is our Lord and King. 
He says in that context, go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, beautiful promise, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. We, therefore, are emissaries. We're ambassadors. We're ambassadors of the King ambassadors in his kingdom. We are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus, for the Lord Jesus Christ, right? imploring men to be reconciled to God, charged with preaching the gospel of the kingdom until through spiritual new birth, those recreated now in the image of their king will fill the earth with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Can you see how where everyone before failed, there were just men, just men, Adam, Abraham, Israel, David, just men. The Lord Jesus Christ triumphs. His kingdom is now inaugurated, but the fullness of his kingdom is not yet consummated. With respect to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, there is an already and not yet. There's a, uh, the fact, the truth, that the kingdom has been inaugurated, but the fullness of the kingdom has not been consummate, consummated. He must rule now until all enemies are made his footstool. Paul gives us an explanation of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Turn there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And look down at verse 20. He must reign now until all enemies, although conquered, are made his footstool. Verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man, the Lord Jesus Christ, also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. 4, verse 25, he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Psalm 110. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. What a tremendous comfort, a tremendous joy, a tremendous faith-building hope it is for the believer that our front runner, the one who went before us, our trailblazer, the captain of our salvation, is now king ruling and reigning from heaven at the right hand of God. Right? An amazing thought. He rules now. There's nothing that's more certain, more sure than the faithful rule of the Son of God. And we must meditate on those great truths during our exile here. Must live as subjects of the king. Richard Sibbs said this. He says, Oh, it is a sweet meditation, beloved, to think that our flesh is now in heaven. It's amazing, right? Our flesh is now in heaven at the right hand of God. And that flesh that was born of the virgin, that was laid in the manger, that went up and down doing good, that was made a curse for us and humbled to death and lay now under the bondage of death three days, that this flesh is now glorious in heaven, that this person is a Lord over the living and the dead. It's amazing. And we await his return and the consummation of the kingdom.
The Bible gives us a prophecy of that consummation, tells us exactly what that will look like and be like. Revelation 19, Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11, John sees a vision of our future. Verse 11, John says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. Sounds very familiar to the, the ancient of days from Daniel chapter 7, doesn't it? Right? His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. Why? Because he is the king. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of his power, a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's his name. Right? That's his title. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. From such humble lows, such humility to such exalted heights. When he comes again, when he comes again, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Baptist Catechism asks this question, how does Christ execute the office of a king? I think it's question 29. The answer is this, Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all of his and all of our enemies. It's a great answer to that question. Have you bowed the knee to him as prophet, priest, and king? Are you living now under his rule and under his authority? Can you rightly be said to be his faithful subject? Are you carrying out his commission to his bride, the church? Uh, do you serve him as king? Have you been delivered from the power of darkness and conveyed into the kingdom of the son of his love. It's interesting that when believers are converted, when they're, when they're genuinely saved, when they turn from sin, and when they put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, they're conveyed to a new kingdom, out of the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of the son of his love. Jesus says to Nicodemus, this comes through new birth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Have you been born again of God's spirit? Have you been born again? We don't see where the spirit moves, but we see the effects of it, right? Like when rustling the trees, we see the fruit. Are you bearing fruit as a son or daughter of the kingdom? Have you been bearing fruit of the spirit? Have you been living as a child of the kingdom? Brothers and sisters, it should give us great hope, great encouragement and comfort no matter how wicked this world is, no matter how wicked this world is, the end for us is certain. The end is sure. The outcome is guaranteed. Those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ as our king, those who have made their garments white in the blood of the lamb, will be with him when he comes to rule. If you continue in Daniel chapter 7, the kingdom then, having been given to Christ at the end of the age, is given to the saints, and they will rule and reign with him forever. When Jesus Christ, our chief, our king, our captain, when Jesus Christ consummates his kingdom, we'll rule and reign with him over all the earth. 
It's an amazing thought, one that should charge us on to live wholeheartedly for him. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, to our king eternal, to our king immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, to you, God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. We as members of the firstborn, the church of the firstborn, who have been seated in the heavenly places with Christ, we praise you and worship you, Christ as our king. And we look forward to the consummation of your kingdom in all its fullness, where we will be there with ten thousands of thousands and innumerable host of saints praising and worshiping our King for all eternity. Thank you, Lord, in your infinite wisdom that you have established him forever and ever, that you establish have established his kingdom forever and ever, a kingdom which will not ever go away. You established his throne forever and ever. You've established us as his people forever and ever. We praise you. We worship you. We thank you for these glorious truths. Help us now in this time where our Lord is ruling and reigning, but this time during which his enemies are made his footstool. Help us, Lord, to live as citizens of that kingdom. We have no continuing city here. We seek the one that is to come, the one whose builder and maker is God. And we have no other ruler or king here but the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that we would submit ourselves to our king. Strengthen us by your spirit to walk worthy of the calling with which we've been called. Help us, Lord, to devote ourselves, heart, soul, mind, and strength to our great king and savior who is God forever blessed. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.